Today at the National Press Club, a debate on the truth about our Aboriginal history. Professor Henry Reynolds will go head to head with Keith Winshuttle, who writes for journals such as Quadrant. Mr Winshuttle argues Professor Reynolds misrepresents historical evidence and says the majority of Aborigines wanted to be assimilated into white society. And to the debate, the truth about our Aboriginal history. Welcome to today's uh, Telstra National Press Club, not address, but debate, and how apt and timely this is, because uh, not a kilometre from here, over at Manuka Oval, there's a titanic struggle going on at the moment between uh, a cricket team selected by uh, the uh, chairman of ATSIC, Jeff Clark, and uh, the Prime Minister's Eleven, headed by Steve Waugh. And over here at the Press Club, we've got the Battle of the Historians. Henry Reynolds and uh, Keith Winshuttle, thanks for coming along for what I think is a debate that uh, Australia has to have. And uh, this is one of the proper forums in which it should occur. So uh, without more ado, let's uh, <coughs> settle down and listen to, first of all, Henry Reynolds on the subject, the truth about our Aboriginal history, and then he'll be followed by Keith Winshuttle, and then it'll be time for questions which they can both respond to or questions as to each individual. First of all, Henry Reynolds, thanks for joining us. What do Keith Winshuttle and I disagree about? Where is the contention? I should begin by stating the basic premises that I stand by in relation to frontier history, and there are four of them. One, the European occupation of Australia was accompanied by sporadic violence which lasted from the 1790s till the 1920s. The 19th century ethnographers Fisson and Howitt wrote in 1880, it may be stated broadly that the advance of settlement has, upon the frontier at least, been marked by a line of blood. The evidence for this contention is vast and various. It comes from every era and every locality. Two, as a consequence of this conflict, many people died and were wounded. Aborigines suffered disproportionately and this trend became more marked as the 19th century progressed and European weapons improved dramatically. Three, while it is possible to provide a rough estimate of the number of settlers who were killed by Aborigines, there can be no certainty about the indigenous death toll. Despite this problem, which is inherent, I decided in 1981 that I should try and give some estimate. I felt it was a responsibility of an historian who had studied this subject to try and arrive at some reasonable estimate of the numbers killed. I said it was reasonable to suppose that 20,000 Aborigines had died in conflict with the settlers. It was and remains an estimate, but it was based on 10 years of research into frontier history. 20 years later, I still think it is a reasonable estimate. I have seen no new research in article, book or thesis to convince me otherwise. Four, such conflict was to be expected given that settlement was conducted without negotiation, treaty or purchase of land. Innumerable settlers expressed their realisation that force was inescapable if settlement was to proceed and dispossession affected. They were not reticent about expressing this view in public. John Forrest, explorer, pastoralist, colonial premier 
founding father and imperial statesman, John Forrest, in the Western Australian Legislative Council in September 1886, had this to say. We went amongst them with our sheep and our cattle, and we found them in an altogether uncivilised state and hostile, and we had to defend our lives and property, not by the strong arm of the law, but by force. That occurred on every station on the outskirts of civilization in these colonies. So my four points are that conflict continued for well over a hundred years, the death toll was considerable, it is impossible to be certain about how many Indigenous people were killed, but that I made what I thought was a reasonable estimate, and that contemporaries, many of them very prominent, like John Forrest, were quite open in, their ex in the expression that force was a necessary component of the settlement of Australia. Well now, it seems to me that Keith and I have two main points of contention. The first is how we should characterise those violent incidents that involved Aborigines and settlers, how we should characterise the incidents we have substantial evidence about and where we wouldn't agree that something had taken place. How should those be characterised? The second area is where the evidence is indirect and circumstantial, and the problem is not so much how we characterise the event, but how we determined what happened at all. Now, Keith, it seems to me, responds to these two situations in different ways. In relation to the first, to events like the Coniston Massacre or Mile Creek that are known, he regards these as being isolated and aberrant. Or they were justified actions by authority, legally proper and morally supportable. In the second case, it is here I think he slips on the white blindfold and refuses to see any evidence at all, no matter how copious and convincing, to anyone unencumbered with layers of white gauze. I want to refer to two incidents we've debated already, or two areas, and they relate to these two things I've referred to. I'll refer briefly to the so-called Battle of Pinjara in Western Australia in 1834, and then more extensively to the case of the Queensland frontier. Let's begin with the Battle of Pinjara. Now, Keith and I would disagree about which evidence to accept and which contemporary accounts give, we should give credence to. I think that is a legitimate disagreement and we will probably both uh, continue to hold the views we do about that. But we would probably would agree on the basic details. That is, that a mixed party of settlers and officials and, and uh, soldiers, a mixed party of 25, went out ostensibly to arrest an Aborigine for spearing a soldier. The man in question was shot and killed, that is the murder suspect. But the encounter continued and uh, Aborigines who were caught in a river, caught in a crossfire, were killed somewhere between perhaps 15 and 40 were killed. We would disagree about how many, but neither of us can be sure. But the fundamental disagreement is how we should characterise this action. Keith, I think, sees this and has, he has said this, that it was an action that was justified both legally and morally, and it was certainly not a massacre. I disagree. It seems to me if you go out to arrest somebody who you quite reasonably believe or might, you, you, you reasonably believe is guilty of murder and that person is shot in the encounter and you come back having killed maybe 20 or 30 or more, it is either a very bungled raid to arrest one person 
or there was something else in mind. And I think there was clearly something else in mind. And we have to see this as we would see a situation like this if it had happened in the Ukraine in 1944 or in Bosnia and East Timor in recent years. That is, it was an atrocity. Today, we would call it a war crime. Now, I move on to the question of Queensland. My argument is that Queensland had a violent frontier, that violence continued from 1840 to the early 20th century. It became more pronounced after 1856, uh, when New South Wales became self-governing, and 1859, when Queensland also was separated and became self-governing. And there was a removal of any supervision from the colonial office in Britain. It's my view that over this 50 years of conflict, up to 10,000 Aborigines were killed. It is true that it is difficult to quantify or count these bodies. One can indeed find numerous accounts of people coming across uh, piles of dead bodies, burnt or not, and you know these are all on the record. But indeed, there is a problem. How do we determine a situation where in the words of Ray Evans, the Queensland historians, the bodies were incinerated rather than enumerated. Now, it seems to me we can, however, prove that there was considerable conflict. For instance, we can establish pretty definitely that somewhere between 800 and 900 settlers were killed in conflict with the Aborigines. And just as many were almost certainly wounded. There were massive stock losses of sheep, cattle and horses throughout this period. We know that the settlers were always armed and they talked openly about using those guns in defence of property and life. The debate, and it was an intense and continuing debate in the Queensland media, obviously the newspapers, wasn't about whether Aborigines were being killed on the frontier, but whether it was justified or not. Added to that is the fact that in Queensland, for 50 years, the native police rode the frontier. That is a mixed force of Europeans and Aborigines. This was a force that uh, was a considerable drain on the Queensland budget. Between 1860 and 1880, it cost in 19th century terms a million dollars in modern terms, many millions of dollars. 200 to 250 troopers were employed patrolling the frontiers of settlement. Their instructions, which were in place from 1857 to 1896, were that they were to have no contact with the tribal Aborigines they met, and that they were to disperse those who were guilty of any offence against property or life, or even any large gathering was to be dispersed. Disperse normally meant to shoot at. This was openly stated by the Attorney General in Parliament in 1861, when he said it was idle to dispute that disperse meant, to, to, disperse meant firing into them. Now, the question arises then, what was this expensive force doing out on the frontier? They took few captives, made few arrests, brought almost nobody to trial, and there were no prisons for Aborigines as there were in Western Australia. What were they doing with the large expenditure of money? In some years they spent more on the native police than they spent on education. What were they doing if they weren't dispersing Aborigines over many, many years and dispersing meant to shoot at them? Now, there was a debate in the Parliament in 1880 when John Douglas, who had been a Premier, Cabinet Minister, and who had just recently been the Minister responsible for the Native Police, the Colonial Secretary, said and I quote, at the present time, the troopers did nothing but shoot them down whenever they could get at them. That was the sole function of the native police. That is from the man who had just 
ceased having ministerial responsibility and had been in numerous cabinets in the 1860s and 1870s. Now, the government spokesman, Arthur Palmer, in Parliament said this was not true, that although certainly Aborigines had to be punished severely, that the native police tried to bring peace to the frontier. But this is not what he believed privately. And in 1882, he wrote a letter in which he said he sympathised with the unfortunate blacks for the way they are treated. They had no place to go, and I quote directly, wherever they are seen by the native police, the rule has been to shoot them. So the responsible ministers between 1877 and 1881 in Parliament said the native police are there to shoot the Aborigines whenever they are seen. I believe there is abundant evidence for the fact that in Queensland there was a reign of terror that went on for many years around the frontiers. Now, if we can't use this evidence to suggest that many Aborigines died on the frontier, it seems to me we have to ask the question, what can historians do? What can they know? And for that matter, one, we should ask, what can journalists do or know if they can't make assumptions from abundant evidence which all points in one direction? Let me conclude by saying that if we can't know about front deaths on the frontier, there's not much we can know at all. We certainly can't say, as many, many commentators, and often the more conservative ones say, ah, but most Aborigines who died, died of disease. But if you use the standards applied by Keith to this evidence, there is almost none there. You can certainly be certain, you can be certain that people died of smallpox because it is apparent by, on their features. But there are very, very few reports, direct reports about disease. There are fewer bodies counted and there are almost no autopsies. So the evidence for Aborigines dying by disease is even less certain than the evidence that people died from violence. So if there are no bodies, if we say no bodies, no violence, we have to say no bodies, no disease. All we could end up saying would be, well, we think there were Aborigines there, many of them disappeared, and we don't know why. And I don't think that is a satisfactory answer for anyone. There are, of course, great problems with how to deal with these events. By their very nature, they happened often in the remotest parts of the colonies. They happened in situations where there were few witnesses and there was every reason to try and cover up what had been done. It's for that reason that it seems to me it is necessary for us to begin to treat this seriously and to treat the Aboriginal dead with the same degree of respect and honour and reverence that we give to the war dead of white Australians, mainly white Australians overseas. And Canberra, above all, is the centre of that industry. And no one doubts that we should continue to treat the war dead with reverence. We also treat it seriously because we conduct uh, very extensive, officially funded research into these matters with official histories, with the War Graves Commission, with the War Memorial. It is time we gave this treatment to the people who died on Australia's frontiers, the people who died in the frontier wars. Thank you very much. Thanks, <coughs> Thanks very much, Henry. And now to uh Put his case and to respond to uh, Henry Reynolds' arguments, Keith Winchuttle, would you welcome him, please? Thank you.
On August 21st last year, America's biggest selling newspaper, The Wall Street Journal, carried a front page story about Australia. It was written by Geraldine Brooks and Tony Horwitz, and it told its readers that beneath the surface of the apparently benign society that was about to host the 27th Olympic Games lurked a dark and shameful history. The story opened with an anecdote about Risdon Cove near Hobart in 1804, when soldiers fired on a party of Aboriginal men, women and children out hunting kangaroos. This was, quote, the opening shot in a war that would re result in the near extermination of Tasmanian Aborigines, the authors wrote. Some of the 50 or so killed that day were salted down and sent to Sydney as anthropological curiosities, unquote. This story was soon followed by another pre-Olympic um, article in the Bangkok Post, written by the expatriate Australian Ben Kiernan, who's Professor of History and Director of the Genocide Studies Program at Yale University in the US. Entitled Australia's Aboriginal Genocides, this article used terminology such as ethnic cleansing and transit camps to conjure images of the wars in the Balkans. Throughout the 19th century, Kiernan wrote, Aborigines quote him, were hunted like wild beasts, having lived for years in a state of absolute terror of white predators, unquote. Among the atrocities he recorded was the 1804 incident at Risdon Cove, where he put the death toll at 40. He also recorded that as late as 1926, white police massacred 100 Aborigines at Forest River in the Kimberley. The two police officers involved, Keenan wrote, were acquitted and promoted. This version of Australian history reached its nadir last year in the book by the journalist Philip Knightley, Australia, A Biography of a Nation. And I'll quote what Knightley says. It remains one of the mysteries of history that Australia was able to get away with a racist policy that included segregation and dispossession and bordered on slavery and genocide, practices unknown in the civilised world in the first half of the 20th century until Nazi Germany turned on the Jews in the 1930s. Unquote. He said the number of Aborigines who died by violence was huge. I'll quote him again. Experts I have consulted say that 50,000 would not be an exaggeration. It could be as high as 100,000. Unquote. Now, while this material was be being presented in the media, the New South Wales Department of School Education was showing school children a film entitled Windradine Wiradjuri Resistance. And the central action of this film is the Bells Falls Massacre north of Bathurst in the 1820s. And the film tells how redcoat soldiers surprised a party of 30 to 40 Aborigines, mainly women and children. The soldiers then drove them to the edge of the falls, where the woman ha women halted, clutching their children. And the film script then continues, quote, with musket fire, they forced them to their deaths over the cliffs of Bells Falls Gorge, unquote. The narrative was illustrated by panoramic shots of the gorge itself interspersed with scenes of Aboriginal children running and dying through the bush. At the same time in Perth, the Western Australian Museum had a display about the Forest River Massacre of 1926. The, the display quoted a man it called a survivor of this incident, an Aboriginal named Grant Najib, Nabiji, and he recalled the death toll. Quote, Picanini, old, old woman, black fella, old man, somewhere about a hundred, unquote. Now, I've used these examples because they all come from outside the realm of academic history. They are typical of the stories now recounted about Australian history in the news media, in our schools and museums. They show how deeply this version of history has now penetrated the wider culture. Our professional historians, however, are the ones responsible for this because it's they who've crea created the intellectual framework for these claims and have given them an aura of academic respectability. The ultimate statement of this outlook is the newly completed National Museum in Canberra, whose architecture borrows its central theme from the Jewish Museum in Berlin, built to commemorate the Holocaust. Now, I've also used these examples because despite the prominence and influence they had, not one of the points I've quoted from them here is true. Take the incident at Risdon Cove. There were two separate reports from the British officers there at the time. Both said a settler and his wife had been surrounded in their hut and threatened by more than 200 Aborigines. Soldiers from a nearby camp came to their rescue and shot at most three people, 
One of the reports said three natives were killed, the other said two were killed and one wounded. Now these officers had no ostensible reason to lie or to downplay what happened. They were only doing their duty. However, at a government inquiry in 1830, a former convict testified that he thought, quote, 40 to 50 blacks had been killed in 1804, even though he admitted he had not been there at the time. Despite this claim being no more than a rumour 26 years after the event, it has allowed those historians who want to beat up this issue to say witnesses have claimed up to 50 Aborigines were killed. Hence, when translated into the wider culture, a defensive action with three adult casualties has become a massacre of 50 innocent men, women and children. And the Wall Street Journal's claim that the bodies were salted down and sent to Sydney for anthropological investigation is another rumour first made in, in 1830 that had no contemporary corroboration. We can be even more certain about the Bells Falls massacre of the 1820s. This is a complete fabrication. There is no contemporary evidence to support it of any kind. In fact, the first reports of this event did not appear in print until 1962, that is, 120 years later, when an article in the Bathurst Times by a local amateur historian reported it as one of the oral legends of the district. Even though the story was nothing more than a folk myth, this did not stop it being taken up and reproduced in two 1988 books, Blood on the Wattle by the journalist Bruce Elder and Six Australian Battlefields by the noted scholar Al Grasby. In 1989, Mary Coe's book, Windradine, a Wiradjuri Koori, published by the Aboriginal Studies Press, claimed this story as part of ancient Aboriginal tradition. And the film I mentioned for school children above is from this book. The event at Forest River in 1926, described by Ben Keenan as one of the hundreds of massacres that took place in the 20th century, has more plausibility. A Royal Commission found that two police while on the hunt for an Aboriginal who had murdered a pastoralist, had themselves shot 11 natives in their custody and burnt their remains beyond recognition. Until recently, historians had no good reasons to doubt their findings. However, in 1999, the Perth journalist Rod Moran, in his book Massacre Myth, published a detailed analysis of the evidence to the Royal Commission and proved beyond reasonable doubt that no such killings ever took place. There were no eyewitnesses, no forensic evidence of human beings killed and no ballistic evidence, no bullets. Moran produced a medical officer's analysis made at the time and largely ignored by later commentators that charred bones found at some campsites were not of human origin or were of indeterminate origin. And they were probably the remains of animals cooked over campfires. The figure of 100 dead at Forest River, cited by both Ben Keenan and Henry Reynolds, comes from Aboriginal oral history collected in the 1970s, that is 50 years later. However, the man whose observations the West Australian Museum claims to be those of a survivor was never at Forest River in this period. Moran shows that to burn a, a human body beyond recognition in the open air would require an average of two and a half tonnes of wood per person. To destroy 100 bodies, the two police at Forest River would have had to collect 250 tonnes of wood in country, when you look at photographs of it, is almost desert. The total number of violent deaths cited by Philip Knightley, that is between 50 and 100,000, is another case of pure invention. The only authority to suggest a total this high is the book Blood on the Wattle by Bruce Elder, a journalist whose normal specialty is rock and roll music. And it's heavily ironic that Knightley who's the author of a very good book on war reporting and propaganda, The First Casualty, has himself succumbed to the kind of atrocity stories he has criticised others for accepting. Among academic historians, the current consensus is that a total of 20,000 Aborigines were killed by whites as the pastoral frontier moved across the continent. And the authority for this figure is Henry Reynolds in his 1981 book, The Other Side of the Frontier. This total, however, is not based on evidence that there actually were this many deaths recorded. Half of the figure comes from Reynolds' own work, um, own count of 10,000 deaths in Queensland, and his methodology was as follows. He took an estimate that 800 to 850 white settlers had been killed by blacks in Queensland. He multiplied this by 10 to produce 8,000 8, to 8,500 Aborigines killed. He then added another 20% 
to bring the figure up to, to, up to 10,000. Nowhere does he explain why he chose a ratio of 10 to 1 black deaths to white. I mean, why not 2 to 1 or 50 to 1 or even money? Or why he then inflated the figure by 20% to get this nice round total of 10,000. This is not how you do history. If you want to claim that Aborigines were killed by whites, you have to produce credible evidence, not a mathematical formula. And by credible, I mean evidence that has been critically examined by skeptical historians. And so far in this whole debate, this approach has been conspicuous by its absence. We should recognise that there have been many people in the last 200 years who have wanted to exaggerate the degree of violence done to the blacks. The current school of historians have taken everything these characters have said at face value. But ours is by no means the first generation to play politics with the Aboriginal death toll. In the early colonies, there were some who were enemies of the governor, such as Henry Melville in Van Diemen's Land, who was jailed for criminal libel, who wrote lurid stories about widespread violence towards the blacks, hoping that the governor's superiors in London would recall him. There were missionaries to the natives who were financially inept, like the bankrupt Lancelot Threlkeld in New South Wales, who told their backers in England that they needed bigger budgets to protect Aborigines because there was so much colonial violence. There were military regiments accused, as many of them were, of laziness and incompetence, who invented stories about killing Aborigines. At Campbelltown in Tasmania in 1828, for instance, the 40th Regiment spread a story that it had trapped 70 Aborigines in a gully and shot them all. But when a local settler went to the site the next day, he found only the bodies of three dogs and no blood on the ground. The regiment's corporal then confessed, I'll quote him, to tell you the truth, we did not kill any of them. We had been out for a long time and had done nothing, unquote. That hasn't stopped three books on Tasmanian history reporting this story as if no one had ever denied it. Then there are the memoirs of some pastoralists written in their old age that recall when they opened up the country, they had to fight drought, floods, bushfires and the blacks. Now some of these stories are fanciful, but some are true. Two of the worst massacres of whites in Queensland were in 1857 at Hornet Bank Station, where Aborigines killed eight members of the, Fra the Fraser family, and in 1861 at Cullen Laringo, where 19 members of the Wills family and their servants, including six children, were killed by the local Aborigines. Now there's documentary evidence that the local police pursued the offenders and needed very little provocation to shoot most of those they caught. But the most notable point about these incidents is their rarity. We do have a small number of regional studies that do provide the detail of most Aboriginal killings in the frontier period. And in these regions, the majority of deaths on both sides resulted from individual conflicts. Most killings were in ones and twos. Massacres, that is intentional mass killings, were rare and isolated. And last year, in a reply to me in the press, Henry Reynolds admitted this quite readily. But unfortunately, this is not the impression left by the history he's written or by any of his followers. Like Ben Keenan, when they summarise the situation, they write of, quote, hundreds of massacres. And they create the completely false notion that the Aborigines suffered the equivalent of the Holocaust. Apart from invented facts, we also suffer the shoddy methodology of these historians. In cases where there are genuine Aboriginal casualties, they invariably choose the highest figure available, no matter how unreliable the witness. They accept Aboriginal oral legends, often more than 100 years old, as serious historical evidence. If documents are missing, they take this as a sign of malpractice. Someone must have destroyed the originals because they had something to hide. They rarely test evidence for its reliability. Information from any sources used, as long as it fits their thesis, the, the assumption being because it fits the thesis, it must be true. And if you challenge any of this and point out its flaws, you are a morally bad person who insults Aboriginal people and wounds their self-esteem. If, if that happens, I am sorry. But this is not just a debate about what was done to the Aborigines. It is also about the character of the nation. The claim made by the, the majority position that you can compare the Australian colonies of the 19th century with Nazi Germany in the 20th is absurd. The notion is wildly anachronistic 
It's conceptually odious and it's historically false. And those historians who have erected what is a mythical edifice should stand back for once and look at their creation with a critical eye. And they should then admit what a grotesque distortion of the truth it is. Thank you. Thanks, Keith. It's now time for uh, questions from uh, media members, at least to start with. And I wonder if you could identify when you, when you ask a question, who, whether it's directed at both members of the panel or at, or at uh, one individual. And uh, each will be given a right of reply in any, in any event. And the first question is from uh, Andrew Clonell. Andrew Clonell from the Sydney Morning Herald. I just wanted to ask what the word sorry and the words practical reconciliation both meant to you gentlemen. And I also wanted to ask Mr Windshuttle if he thought that white Australians now had anything to feel guilt or, or shame over in terms of what our ancestors might have done. Well, I, I don't subscribe to the view of the Prime Minister that these events happened so far, so long ago that we don't have any responsibility for them. We've inherited this country and we've inherited it warts and all. And if there were injustices and terrible things done in the past, then we really have to face them squarely and do what we can to rectify them. But my point about, um, about the, the whole historical debate is that the, the historical case that's been put forward by what's now the orthodox position in academic life and in the media uh, is, is not true. It's not backed by the evidence. And so, and so I don't want to say we have nothing to be sorry about because that would obviously be absurd. Um, there was a, a clash between uh, a predatory imperial power, Britain, in the late 18th century, and a, 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 a several nations of hunter-gatherer tribes in Australia. Um, and it was, it was quite clear who was going to win. It, it, it would have been clear if any other nation in the world had come to Australia and done the same thing. But, but the, the, the point I'm making is that the, is that the historians have grotesquely exaggerated the, the evidence. They don't have the claims that, uh, they don't have the evidence for the claims they are making. And, um, and so that's, that's, the, that's, that's the case I want to make. Henry? Um, there were two questions first. Uh, what do I... Uh, the question of sorry. Uh, well, yes, I suppose like many people, I feel that uh, the Prime Minister should do what all the state premiers have done without the sky falling down. Uh, I think that would be important. Uh, practical re reconciliation seems to me to be about those things which should be done anyway and have nothing to do with reconciliation, really. They simply are providing the services which should have been provided by local, state and federal governments anyway. And it's a, it's a case of catch-up. Um, in terms of um, um, have we got things to be ashamed of? Well, Keith is right in many ways, of course. Uh, this situation was likely to unfold the way it did, but he seems to assume that it couldn't have been better. Now, I, I dispute that. I think if you compare, for instance, the settlement of Western Canada in the 1860s and 1870s with the settlement of Queensland by very much the same sort of societies, they are profoundly different. And I think uh, the situation could have been much better in Australia than it was. OK, the next question is from uh, Emma MacDonald. Hi, Emma MacDonald from the Canberra Times. Um, Robert Mann has recently noted um, that while, I guess this question is for Mr Winshuttle, while historians such as Professor Reynolds and even Geoffrey Blamey, they've both come to roughly the same estimates on the number of Aboriginals killed. But he's noted that you have never done your own independent research. So my question would be, why not? And on what basis do you make your statements? Well, you don't want to believe everything that Robert Mann says in his articles, because it's simply not true. Um, I've come to this area in, in recent times, but I've done a lot of work, um, especially in the Tasmanian archives, where I've spent um, a large amount of the last three months um, going through the records there. And um, I, I was one of those people who taught Australian history uh, and used the secondary sources as, as my source material, because I wasn't teaching, I wasn't researching Aboriginal history, but I had to teach it, as you, as you do when you're a university lecturer. And I relied upon the work that, um, that Reynolds and Charles Rowley before him had put forward, and I taught it as gospel for um, the two of them for the best part of 20 years. It was only uh, early last year that I discovered that Henry, in fact, didn't have the evidence for his claims, that he had used, in fact, a mathematical formula. Um, and, and I thought, um, this, is not this is not how you do history. This is, is, is grossly misleading. 
Um, so in Tasmania, um, the story that that Henry was putting today, um, that is, you can, you, you can take the number of, of whites who are killed by Aborigines and multiply it several times um, in order to get the um, number of, of Aborigines who are killed. Uh, in Tasmania, that is simply not true. I've, I've checked every historian's count of, um, of Aboriginal deaths in, in Tasmania, and my view is um, that the Aborigines killed twice as many whites as whites killed Aborigines. You also have to um, uh, look at some other regions where we have a, we have a very good study of Monero District by Keith Hancock, and there was no conflict in uh, Monero District between whites and Aborigines. Um, Henry Henry talks about uh, disease and and how the Aborigines couldn't have died of disease, but Hancock makes it very clear in the Monero District uh, the big killer was in uh, oh, not sorry not the big killer, but the fact the reason why the Aboriginal population um, eventually uh, was reduced to nil was because of venereal disease. Uh, the Aborigines caught syphilis and gonorrhea. Um, from other Aborigines because there were no whites in the area. Uh, when, when the first whites in, uh, arrived in Monero, there were, um, th those diseases were rife among the Aborigines, so that it spread up from, from Port Phillip. Um, but it, it was the failure of the Aborigines to reproduce that um, led to the population demise in that particular region. You can't apply mathematical formulas a, a, to a whole state like Queensland uh, because there are different regions which have di quite radically different histories. They were settled at different times. When Queensland was first settled, the guns available there were single-shot mus muskets, which, um, were, were, um, which is one of the reasons why, if there are any massacres beforehand, you really should, sus you really should suspect the claims about the total numbers because single-shot muskets um, couldn't massacre the sort of 300, we're told, were killed in, um, in, in, in Waterloo Creek in 1838. Um, later in, in the century, uh, the, the claims that Henry made today about um, uh, uh, ordnance becoming much more um, sophisticated and, 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 uh, and more available to kill people is certainly true. But uh, in the early period, it was not. And so you can't go applying general mathematical formulas because the guns in the early period were different. The diseases in the early period were different. Um, to, to try and use one blanket explanation, one blanket way of counting the figures is, uh, is not to do history at all. Henry, your response? Yes, I, I can't believe, Keith, that you treated my work as gospel at uh, any stage, but uh, I, I wouldn't want you to do that. Um, I'll make one point, uh, and that is, as I remarked, if you say it is difficult to establish that people were killed by violence, how can you say, following Hancock, that they died of venereal disease? How do you know? What, how, many, how many people were examined? What autopsy reports do you have? What evidence do you have? You simply have hearsay that people died of venereal disease, or people had venereal disease and didn't breed. There simply isn't the evidence there. If you don't have evidence about violence, you don't have evidence about disease either. Well, according to Hancock, they, um, they knew very clearly what it was because they examined the people, especially the, the last members of the local Monero tribes. The, the medical doctors knew them very well. Where are the medical <coughs> reports? You see, you, you, you get yourself in a situation where you can't establish anything if, if, if you apply your sort of standards. Okay, without wanting to appear the total control freak, we might just move on to the next question, which I think is from uh, Michael Madigan. Uh, my question is to Professor Reynolds. Um, if the view of your opponent prevailed and mm -hmm. Australia came to see its history as reasonably benevolent, what, in your view, would be the, the price the country would have to pay for uh, continuing to refuse to acknowledge the, the atrocities which you say occur? Do you see the, the rise of a, of a militant... Uh, arm of Aboriginal society, or do you think that assimilation will eventually take place and Aboriginals would just accept their lot? Um, the question of assimilation is a difficult one. Um, it, it may indeed be over the next hundred years that the assimilation Haslack was talking about will take place, but we don't know that. Uh, we, have, we, 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 can't, we can't be sure how that will unfold. In terms of the history, uh, as I've remarked, uh, Aboriginal communities, uh, by and large, uh, do have uh, a history of their own, uh, which certainly in which violence in the past plays a major time. The killing times, the shooting times, the rifle times, they have names for the period. 
and in many cases they actually, in, in more recently settled places, they actually know f through their genealogies. And that's why, uh, despite what Keith says about Forest River, uh, it is most likely there was a massacre, because uh, the Aboriginal community there has always said that was the case. And uh, Professor Elkin, who was there two years after the massacre, doing the genealogies, uh, said that the, there are people missing and these are the people who I was told were killed in the massacre. So the Aboriginal community thinks there was. Now, they may be mistaken. So if, w if we say, no, 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 this is the sort of stuff that, that, that people write about violence is wrong and it was a benign history, I think indeed uh, there will be, continue to be two histories, a black history and a white history, as there was in the past although the black one wasn't written down. And as I said long ago, uh, if you are to have one nation, you probably have to have one story. And if we can't accept their side of the story, it seems difficult to think we're going to be one nation. Okay. Um, in 1970, Charles Rowley wrote a book called The Destruction of Aboriginal Society, which is the book that's really set the whole uh, standard for um, the historiography that's come in its wake. And, in the, and for the first 10 years, um, it was virtually the book that everyone used. In that 10 years period, we had uh, the whole land rights movement, we had the Racial Dis Discrimination Act, we had a whole range of positive measures uh, done by governments, we had, we had a, a, a black power movement of, of some sorts, we also had, we saw a burgeoning of Aborigines coming to the arts, into the education system, and all the rest of it. Uh, on, on, largely on the strength of the, of the story that, that um, Rowley had, had, had uh, said. But in terms of um, the, the violence, Rowley said, um, even though he, re he recognised, uh, in, in fact told most of the story that subsequent historians have told, he said the, the deaths itself was, and I'll quote him, a comparatively small rate of homicide compared to other countries. Now, it was only when Henry came along in 1981 and quantified that, said, look, 20,000, this is a, a, a huge figure, it's more than uh, some districts have had in, uh, in terms of their overseas war dead. Uh, it was only then that, um, that, that, that the that talk about holocausts and genocides started to be taken seriously. And my view is that uh, Rowley's story is largely correct. It was a comparatively small rate of homicide. I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not denying... Um, uh, a large part of the of the original story. What I am denying is this claim that it was a Holocaust, that it's in any way com comparable to Nazi Germany, um, or that we um, really uh, have got to make the kind of reparations that the German people made to uh, the Jews, because our history is not of that kind. Just before we go to the next question from the from the, 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 our media members, I just wonder if I could ask Henry whether if he was going if he had his time again in working up the estimates of the number of dead uh, through the period of the 19th century and the early 20th century, whether you would use the same formula or whether you think it needs revision, and if so, how? Um, this, uh, if you'll pardon me, uh, takes Keith's argument that I used the formula. I didn't. I didn't. I had spent many years reading about conflict I began uh, copying down every incident and had pages and pages and pages of them. I wasn't, this wasn't my prime research uh, subject. I then started simply leaving many and only copying down those where there was some, something different about it. In the end, I simply stopped recording material. I just know there is a vast amount of evidence about violence. Now let me also say, you know, this is something I don't know whether I should, I should have told you this in private, Keith. I was called the other day by people in Queensland who have discovered the Queensland Native Police records. And they bear out almost exactly everything that I've said from the other evidence. That is, there is a, a detailed evidence about massive killing by the Queensland Native Police in the government records which have been discovered. So, as I say, I, uh, it looks as though I used the formula, but I didn't. It was, it was an estimate based on everything I'd read over a long, long time. So, no, I, I didn't. I, I think just applying a formula, as Keith said, would be silly because, of course, districts are different. Um, t it, it stretches over a long period of time. Uh, attitudes change, weapons change, all sorts of things change. And he's also right, I suspect, about Tasmania. It, it is possible that the Aborigines killed more whites than the reverse. It is possible. 
So, uh, yes, I didn't use a formula. And I think that 20,000 is still, I think eventually people will think it's, it's slightly higher. I know uh, someone is, um, uh, so, you know, some, some, some quite uh, our most eminent scholars think I underestimated it. But, you know, that's, we, we will never know for sure. Okay. Well, I think that we can, if not know for absolute certainty, we can get a very good idea by doing what Henry should have done, and that is uh, looked at the, at the regional studies. There's, there are close local histories where some people have done proper studies of what happened in their particular region. They know, uh, they've sifted through the evidence where there are simply claims, rumours, you know, 20, 50 years after the event, and where we do have reasonable evidence that things happened. Uh, in the southwest, uh, sorry, the south, sorry, yes, the southwest of Western Australia, uh, in the frontier period, that is the, the period when there was this conflict between blacks and whites, the, de the ab number of our ab Aboriginal dead was about 120. In Tasmania, my count is less than 100. Uh, on the northern, ri northern rivers of New South Wales, we, we have a detailed study which says about 100. Now, what Henry should have done was put together all those regional studies. Uh, he should have fostered other people to go and, and do regional studies of the same kind, because it's only then when we do regional studies, and we'll find some, like Hancock found in Monero, where there was no conflict at all, there were no Aborigines killed by whites in any direct sense. Um, it's only when we've done all those regional studies that we can t start to talk seriously about, about, about this idea. On the uh, Queensland Native Police, uh, I'm glad to hear we've found those records, because so far Henry's been going around saying a lot of things about the Queensland Native Police on the basis of a, a almost complete absence of records. The Native Police were founded in 1857, and as he admits in his own book, Black Pioneers, the records from 1859 onwards uh, are missing. They, 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 well, he couldn't find them. If they've been found now, well, that's, that's good news. But for uh, 20 years, Henry was going around saying that the uh, native police, even though we didn't have any records, were the worst kind of killers um, you've ever imagined. Now, in Victoria, we do happen to have a very closely argued study. We have all the records, or pretty well all the records, of the, of the Victorian native police intact. And the author of the major study of those, um, uh, based on those records, Murray Fells, argues that the Victorian Native Police were a force of peace. They prevented depredations between, um, of whites against Aborigines and of Aborigines against whites. And she says they were responsible in the 1840s for the relative absence of any kind of conflict in that, in that decade between whites and Aborigines. So in Victoria, we have the Native Police being a force for police where we do have good records. In Queensland, where, well, uh, let me say now, no one has yet studied the records, we're, asked to ex uh, we're expected to believe the Native Police are a, a marauding band, to, a band of killers on the basis of, of a lack of evidence. Uh, you can't have it always, Henry. Keith. The, pre the people who were in the government, who ran the Native Police, said they shot people on site. That's what they were there for. Now, isn't that evidence? There, okay. Isn't that evidence mm, there, that that's what was happening? All right, well, there, there, is, there is evidence in Victoria. There was evidence in, uh, in Victoria of one massacre in the, in the Snowy River region that the Victoria Native Police were alleged to have committed. And uh, it was in the press. It was in the parliament. Um, there, was, um, there was one group of the Native Police accused the other group of Native Police of doing it. And what Fell showed is that someone actually went to the site quite independently and, and found one body um, who, had, who, who had been killed by a member of the Native Police. In a way, I mean, the, 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 the member of the Native Police who killed this person said he did it in self-defence, he was ambushed and he killed this person in self-defence. But whatever it is, it was, it, in the end it came down to um, one person from a big story in Melbourne, the Native Police are out there massacring people right, left, right and centre, <coughs> it comes down to one killing. Now, um, those parliamentarians in Queensland had, as, had even less information about what was going on in Queensland as the people in Victoria did at the same time. They were the responsible ministers, Keith. So you're saying that... that well, the responsible minister in Victoria also thought terrible things were going on. No, no. But he was wrong about that. No, no, no. no. And when you say I don't have evidence, that's, that's just not true. There, there, there is vast amounts of evidence about Queensland Police on every study done on Queensland. And it isn't true to say there are no regional studies. Every single regional study, and I, I've read all of them, bears out the same story. And you can't simply say, well, in Victoria, and I think Murray Fell's book is a whitewash, but you can't say in Victoria this was a good force in Queensland. They are totally, I mean, you, you are doing what you accuse us of doing. That is, you are, you are saying they're called the Native Police there in the 1840s, so in the 1860s they must be the same. 
It no. is a totally different situation because in the 1860s you no longer have an imperial government, you no longer have supervision by the colonial office, you no longer have governors, you no longer have that sort of control. It is now in the hands of the settlers and it's a totally different story. Okay. Gentlemen, I think we had better move on if we, if we can. Uh, next question is from Lincoln Wright. Right, the camera times. Um, I wanted to, to ask two questions. The first question is uh, just coming back to uh, Robert Mann again. Robert Mann has alleged that a, a conspiracy of sorts, he didn't use that word, he called it a political campaign, has developed over the issue of the stolen generation and involves certain key groups in the country, including very influential media columnists, we all know who they are, uh, certain think tanks, uh, yourself, Mr. Windshuttle, and of course the Howard government. I was wondering whether or not. Um, uh, either of you would like to make a comment on the reality of that, of that charge, whether or not it's, uh, it's exaggerated. And my second question is to Mr. Winshaw. Mr. Winshaw, you, like Robert Mann, you've changed your political spots too. He was once on the right, he now seems to be on the left. You were once on the left, you now seem to have fallen in with the sort of New York, New Criterion crowd. I was wondering, they have a, they have, they have a habit of um, dealing with certain issues in the United States, the neoconservatives, which is to basically dismiss the claims of any sort of indigenous uh, minority groups as a matter of course. Um, in your case, I think Edward, you've attacked Edward Said, the Palestinian uh, rights activist. I was wondering whether or not you, you see yourself as extending that uh, cultural critique to Australian cultural battles. Well, I'm not funded by any think tanks. Um, I'm a retired academic and um, I get, I've got no sponsoring bodies of any kind. M this project um, of, of mine doesn't result from any vast right-wing conspiracy, as, as Hillary Clinton wants to call it. In fact, it started off, um, it, it had two origins. I, I, was, I was going to do a review of the book by Mas Masker Myth by Rod Moran, the, um, the Perth journalist, uh, because he, he spoke to me and said, look, no one has reviewed this properly. The book has been sort of buried. And I said, look, I'll see if I can do something in Quadrant for you. It was going to be a one-off uh, story, and that's all. At the same time, I came across Philip Knightley, who's a man I've admired all my adult life. And I think the, the first casualty is, is one of the great books about journalism, um, whatever I think about his other book. Um, and uh, I couldn't believe um, this um, comparison between, the, uh, between Nazi Germany in the 30s and Australians in the, in the 19th century, because I'd taught enough Australian history to know that sort of claim is just absurd. And it was the combination of those two factors that led me to write this. Now, I, I've never written anything about the Stolen Generation, and it, it turned out that my paper on, um, on the myths of frontier massacres was delivered at a conference which was mainly concerned about the, um, about the um, Stolen Generation, and that was purely fortuitous. I happened to finish my paper at the same time that conference was on, and it seemed like a good venue to, um, to present it. So, I mean, Robert Mann's idea that there's some kind of... Um, um, think tank that's supporting the um, Howard government is, um, is, is like most of his other claims on this subject. Henry and uh, uh, make it Yes, uh, on both sides uh, who, who used to be Cold War warriors, although they have sw swapped chairs, see conspiracies. There's no doubt that Robert Mann sees a conspiracy, but I think so do many of those he attacks. They think there is a great conspiracy uh, of who they call the elites um, who are undermining Australia. So both sides uh, have, a, have a nose for conspiracy.